Wesley, I'll, uh, I'll start with you. So, so much attention on your band from one record, from a debut record. How does it feel to finally have another piece of work out there into the world? It feels like we have double the material to pull from, which is a very good thing. So I think we feel more prepared um, to have people come into shows because the first time around it was sort of rinse and repeat every night. There was only, we kept joking, it was 43 minutes long, the record, and they want us to play like an hour and 15. So we were really doing our best to pull a rabbit out of a hat, but this time around we have, you know, the actual material to fill that time. So. You would never think about that, would you, when you kind of going out into the world with your debut album, like, oh man, like... I don't have enough material right now. Yeah, it's a good problem. What the, yeah. what the fans want, yeah. Um, Neela, any thoughts for you about having the second album out there into the world? Yeah, certainly the same as Wes uh, to be able to play um, bigger shows and uh, give their fans the money's worth. But I think also just that there's people waiting for an album is something that's really exciting um, and was not the case on the first record. So mm -hmm. the, the fact that we feel that sort of anxious energy from our fan base um, is really exciting. Well, what was the case uh, on the first album? Let me just get this uh, out of the way right now. You went from unknown to global superstars in a span of a couple months. That's a wild experience. Uh, Jeremiah, what's the high, what was the highest high of that whole crazy journey? There were a lot of highs. With highs, there were lows. But uh, there were a lot of highs. I mean, it was probably playing a, a technically a hometown show, this venue called Red Rocks. It's about a 10,000-person outdoor amphitheater. And when I first moved to Denver with Wes, I used to look at a photo of Red Rocks every morning, sort of trying to dream about that's my goal, that's what I wanted to see happen. And then we did it, and um, now we get to play there as a headlining act, and it's just it's an amazing uh, feat for us, I think. What about you, Wesley? Any kind of peak, surreal moment that stands out for you? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's just a lot to point to, and it's kind of like spin a wheel. I remember we were in, um, we were in Japan, and there was a kid that was singing along to Big Parade. And then I got to meet him after and thank him, and he didn't speak a lick of English. And I realized he had learned all the sounds of the words for this really long lyrical song. Uh, that's how much he loved the band, and we were trying to get him like a set list or something, uh, thinking that uh, you know we could have a conversation, and it was all through music. So I think for me it was just, wow. it was just crazy to be in Japan and somebody there even had heard of us, much less had done that with the music. I think both of those sum up that experience pretty well. What about you, Neela? Yeah, um, we did Saturday Night Live, which I think was all kind of a big peak for us as well. Um, it's just really fun and something so iconic and puts you on the map with people who maybe aren't uh, always music fans. And I, I see new bands on that show all the time, so it's kind of a neat way to share your music. Who was hosting? Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, nice. Katniss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wesley, I read you said something really interesting, that people ask you about your success almost with a sadness yeah, sometimes, yeah. like something bad happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think is behind that? Well, maybe it's the twisted uh, American dream where they love the struggle, but they, they love to see you have struggled, but they hate to see you like sort of succeed in a weird way. There's something odd about the climb up. I felt like there was a whole bleacher section of cheerleaders. And then when, you, when they feel like you've, reached, you've had your fill and you've had enough, hmm. then they're ready to sort of take an ax to you, um, and it's time to prove it. Uh, I guess try to hold your place. Uh, we can't sneak up on anybody anymore. So I think part of it is um, just getting back to the roots of what we started with. But it is a funny thing. That's, I, that is really interesting. Is that something you observed as well, Neela? Yeah, certainly. I think people are really rooting for you. Um, and it's an it's an odd thing to experience because you'd think you, those people want to hear more music from you and therefore want your career to thrive but <laughs> yeah it is just sort of i don't know something natural that happens to their credit like you know we we were sitting here feeling pretty lucky at the same time you know like yeah. in terms of like thinking we deserve something very tangible and specific based on what we're doing it doesn't make any sense we just wanted to play music full time so we got our dream a while ago yeah so i see why sometimes people are like nobody deserves x y or z but uh, we're still we're still feeling like we want to you know prove our place and you know, sort of hold our own. And even with an album where everybody's like, we know you now, what else can you do? Mm. You know? Well, I mean, I can see kind of the, the gratitude in all of your faces. At the same time, Wesley, you've also said that dealing with success was a lot harder than dealing with failure. In yeah. Summer. What did you mean by that? Um, you know, take a tangible um, example. We, we were in L.A. touring, and we got robbed during the day one day, very early on in, in, our, in our touring days. And... You like, think your, that, like your van? Or? Yeah, like in broad yeah. daylight in L.A., the guy busted in a van, took Neela's cello, took my mom's guitar that I wrote a lot of songs on and another one, and then 
took uh, a bunch of other things, personal things. Um, and, you know, that night we went on to play a house show, borrowed instruments, and continued a, another two and a half weeks of touring and just everywhere along the way people donated cellos, they donated guitars. Wow. And that brought us together and that sort of made everyone, uh, you know, just work and almost like galvanized us, you know. But when you, uh, I think the odd part about success was it sort of makes little islands out of a group. You sort of retreat, and it's not in a bad way, but it's more like a, a mode of survival where you're you're in a new place every day, and people are sort of treating you a little differently. I remember we were in Canada. It's one of the few places we've ever been truly kind of like harassed by paparazzi, you know, and wow. that kind of stuff of just dealing with that new reality. I think that that um, that plays into feeling a little bit like isolated and so success made it complicated because your ego grows like everything just changes around you and, and you have to learn how to live in this new this new world you live in you know? i'd imagine there'd be fewer people that can relate also yeah to that experience, I mean, which must be isolating unless yeah and i think the way i would combat that is just by reconnecting with friends who valued me for something that what had nothing to do with music mm -hmm. because I, I could connect with them on something real um because for the longest time we were anonymous and I didn't buy into that being that important either. So why yeah. why should I buy into the, like, I think it's great when we're in an airport or something, somebody comes up and says, I really appreciate what you did. Can I get a whatever? That's, that's I feel thankful for that, but I don't, that person doesn't know me. You know, they, they like the music we made. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there and uh, it causes some confusion. You know? I, I want to come back to that in a second, but I want to get your thoughts, Jeremiah, because you kind of hinted that there are, of course, great highs, but also lows with this kind of success. What were you uh, meaning by that? I think for an individualistic point of view, I think the idea of dealing with success is in a way a little bit harder than failure. I think when I was a teenager, I would have looked at somebody like myself in this position as that guy made it. He's made it. He's probably infinitely happy and he's just got it made. And I feel like there's still a lot left to do. I mean, we're still human beings, a lot left uh, music to make. And I don't feel like we've just made it and now we're coasting. I feel like... Um, failing and constantly reworking stuff was something I was more used to than being successful or being part of a successful band. So I'm really happy with it, but it is, I want to be weary because I think the day that I say we've made it and I'm a great musician is probably the day that I'll start to decline and maybe the, decompose a little bit. The so. comfort and resting on your laurels. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I think I'm really weary of that. Maybe too much, but I'm, I'm more comfortable in that zone than being like, we got this, we made it, yeah. you know? <laughs> Keep the urgency. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about connecting with those friends. Like, could you tell me about some of those friendships and those connections that have been important for grounding you? Yeah, I have, uh, I made all my friends, it seems like, young, and then I just stopped making as many friends. But, uh, so all my groomsmen were, there. there's about, it's, it's like my brother, a few friends, it's Jer, it's like the... It's the kind of people you can go to, I would call them like my counsel. Like if I have a crisis, I, I ask people's opinion that I really trust their, you know, their viewpoint on things. And um, I just thought I never really wanted to be valued for something that, like I, I value me for my loyalty or my trustworthiness or, you know, things like that that you have to prove over a long period of time. Don't value me for something that's fleeting like this. Like so when, if a, if a family member came up and said, we're so proud of you. I would say, well, what are you proud of me for? You know, like in my head, even though I would graciously say, oh, thanks. But uh, I really appreciate it. Like my uncle said, you know, I was most proud of you when you played this one venue where there's a bunch of people there, 100, 200 people. And then the next night there was about 25 and the mics didn't work. So you guys just took the amps and mics and put them away and played the show with so much passion. He's like, that's when I was proud of you. Mm -hmm. You know, when you seemed like you really were in it for good reasons, you loved music and uh, you carried on and, and, and persevered. So I'd rather be, uh, I'd rather have people in my life that value me for that because I know I could be that for a long time and, and feel that. But mm -hmm. if you value me because I'm uh, the flavor of the month, then you value me for a month yeah. and then that's it, you know? So I need that. Uh, Neil, I want to ask you about going in to record this album. Uh, was there a mantra or like a goal, a, a focus that kind of you guys united around? Um, I think it had a lot of the same principles of the first record. Um, Wes and Jerry spent a lot of time making demos prior to going into the studio, so not a lot of time is spent figuring things out. Um, and I think there's just a minimalistic approach that goes into all of it. Um, it's kind of put your egos away and, uh, you know, whatever serves the song best and not the person. There's a larger-than-life character at the center 
of this record. Uh, Wesley, could you tell us about your Cleopatra? Yeah, well, most of that song, not all of it, but most of it's based on a real person that I, I heard about and eventually met. Her name is Manana. She's from the Republic of Georgia. Uh, you know, I always say next to Russia because we, you know, we get that confused in America at least. Um, Atlanta. And, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and she was the first female taxi driver. She has sort of, she's older now and she's got this, uh, tough gait about her as she walks, how she carries herself. She smokes, she drinks hard. And, uh, but she was telling me about her life. I learned about her life through that, uh, through a friend, a translator. And she basically, it, I got my attention from the beginning because I had heard that she had fell in love, um, with this at about 16, she fell in love and the boyfriend asked her to marry him. But she was in the midst of losing her father. He died, and she didn't give him an answer. And he just left the house that he had tried to propose to her in and tracked out mud from from a rainstorm that was going on. And uh, she never saw him again. And this was like her great, the great love of her life she felt like she had missed out on. And so um, she refused to wash the mud off of, off of her, off of her floor, off of her carpet. And uh, that's, that was just, that just stopped me dead in my tracks. And I was like, what is what was what, tell me more about this person you know and uh the more i learned the more it, it was sort of such a contrast to what i was used to hearing or seeing rather in in today and how we i guess way best way to put it is like we advertise how great our lives are via social media uh it's never been an era like this we have like billboards for our own lives like we're pr people for ourselves mm-hmm. and she was the anti of that she was confronting some things that didn't particularly go well and uh, without flinching, it was just like she was looking at it and telling me what she saw when, it's, when I feel like we rationalize a lot of why we're where we're at. So um, that's what the song was based on, this really mm. arresting character, which is why the even choosing the cover art was very important. So Cleopatra came from when she was younger, she felt like this indestructible character. Do you, you know? often draw inspiration from characters like that that you meet? I, I mean, I think that's a lot more interesting than I'm on the road and I miss home and so I, I I try to look for it, um, but like writers or joke tellers or whatever else, you kind of, it's great, but I see the world where I'm really looking for that. I really am interested in that because that's rare to find like a, a beautiful and interesting person like that. Um, and so, yeah, you don't find them too often. So when you do, you try to learn more about them. Jeremiah, are you similar in terms of your songwriting inspirations? You look a lot outside of yourself and other people. Sure. I don't write any of the lyrics, so mm-hmm. I draw from different inspirations. But I think for me, it's more of just uh, with regards to music, whether it's piano or guitar, it's just continually, uh, constantly going back. And if I see a great movie or something, that could draw some inspiration. But I think um, for me, it's just constantly going back to the, the process and trying to draw yeah from where I can. Uh, in terms of process, this album is very much... Well, from what I know of you guys, it's you guys. You did it your way. I don't see any Max Martin credits uh, on this album or anything like that. Uh, Nila, was it hard to remain focused and kind of keep in control of what you guys do uh, at a time when a lot of bands are probably thinking about going in a million different directions? Sure. I think we've surrounded ourselves with the right kind of people um, as far as our label and our management. And um, I think they figured that out pretty quickly, too, that we do want to be very hands-on. Um, and I, you know, that, that is, that speaks a lot to our labels that we have, that we work with Dynalone here in Canada and Dual Tone in, in the States. Um, and I think they're really kind about letting us be who we are, um, and not trying to make us into sort of this machine. Uh, Jeremiah, what about this minimal approach that Neela talked about earlier, the importance of keeping things kind of small? I think it's the idea of, with regards to the music, keeping it uncluttered, having a very minimalistic, um, startling or arresting, whether piano idea or vocal idea or, or guitar idea. And that was very much embodied the first album. The second album, it's still very much the same mantra and thesis, but this one was more plugged in. And we just like that, the uncluttered sound and have that, um, are drawn to stuff that's easy to comprehend to ourselves because we're so inundated with sounds and overproduced music, I feel like, mm-hmm. um, that it's really nice to make something that we feel like we're filling a void in music. Now, at the same time, you guys have three extra people uh, here versus last time you were here. So how do you manage to keep the ideas uh, clear and concise when you do have uh, bigger arrangements a little bit? Well, it's kind of like everybody's doing something very simple. And when you put it all together, it creates this kind of um, beautiful structure. But if one person by themselves, it wouldn't sound necessarily great. 
again, all these songs could work on just a piano or just a guitar with Wes's voice, but I think the real craft and a lot of the hard work is in instrumentation. You know, writing the song is equally hard, but then fleshing it out, whether to how much cello, how much electric guitar, uh, once you have five or six of us at times, all doing something very simple, it really creates this kind of like giant um, transformer, if you will. Everybody's got, got their own role. Voltron type of yeah, situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what what is harder, uh, Wes, do you think, um, writing the songs or, or arranging them? Well, uh, I find arranging a lot more fun. Uh, when you have, I think the hardest thing is when you have, let's say, a great chorus or a great verse, um, and you know it's out on an island and you really don't have nothing to sort of complement it. Um, that's almost worse than having no idea because you know how good it could be. And then the ideas that you put up against it seem to pale in comparison until you f hopefully find like we have one song that it's probably been with us for eight years that we still haven't put out because it has no compliment to it you know and it's mm. like this great idea I'd, i could show it to you and you'd say i think you'd say that's a really sweet that's a beautiful idea but we'd say but it's not a song you know it's sort of an idea right now so for me it's 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 finding those uh those chords and 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 the right verse and chorus and things like that and then once we we start to dress it up you already know what's underneath is beautiful, and it's just the now you put an outfit on it, but it's already sort of like a top model. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, uh, one song I want to ask you about on this album is "Gun Song." True. Where'd that one come from? Um, yeah, that one came from. It's it's a it's a bit. I want to say it's a few years older than some of the other songs, and and I and its idea. But we started playing it live in the set sometimes. Um, it was a uh, I. I had found, so my dad had passed away in 2007, and right around that time, um, I was running late for a job. I was working waitering and bartending or something. I needed black socks or else I'd be, you know, sent home. And I was out of clean black socks, so I went into his drawer, my dad's, because I knew the clothes would still be in there. It was that kind of fresh, you know? And gra reach in without looking and then pull out a pistol, not knowing he had a gun in, in the house, much less in his sock drawer. And he was gone and I couldn't ask him, what is it? What is this about? Mm -hmm. And it just kind of made me think, oh, what other things don't I know about this person alive or passed away, alive or dead? Uh, like we all do that to each other. Um, but it was, it was a bit frustrating to know. I couldn't, I couldn't mm -hmm. really get to the bottom of it because he's not around to answer. So it got me going on that. It's become a sort of, um, what do you call it? Like a hot button song already is not even out yet but it's it's the title alone is setting people off because there's a lot of controversy around mm -hmm. um around the gun gun rights issue in america so but i i kind of welcome it because i i think it should be talked about and it's not something maybe we're we're really we're really talking about intelligently we're just sort of like that's mine you know so mm -hmm. i wish we would get to the bottom of it well i thought it was intriguing because it does approach um it does approach the issue in this family context, which I think gets lost a lot of times. It's, it's viewed as this political issue and less a cultural issue and a, a family issue at bottom, right? Right. Well, my dad was a hunter and like he was around guns growing up his whole life. So I don't and I don't at its core have a problem with it. But I think it was talking about, yeah, it's in the context of him protecting me, essentially. It sounds like I'm aiming the gun at someone, but then it's it's my father protecting me with this gun that... Uh, I'm saying I don't own. So, um, yeah, that which is ironically probably how most most accidents happen with a in, in the home by you know a child of a gun owner. A lot a lot of bad things happen. So I don't think his was loaded, for the record. <laughs> I think it was just a deterrent. Uh, you guys are about to go back and play another song, but before you do, um, this is a record that is not going to disappoint your fans uh, all over the globe. I'm going to go ahead and make the prediction that it will be another success. Neela, how, how do you think uh, success will feel this time around after what you've gone through? I think, uh, I don't want to say we're more prepared, but <laughs> we're a little more prepared than the first time around because it was. It was so fast, and the learning curve was just insane. Um, and our lives were very, very different five years ago than they are now, um, kind of leading into that first record. So, um, and even just wrapping our brains around the fact that we're now professional touring musicians. And I don't think that we understood that really at the beginning of the first record. Um, and learning to tour and just that, that sort of thing. Approach so. it like work. Kind <laughs> yeah, of thing. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Jeremiah, the bond that you guys have as a band, how do you think that's going to uh, affect this next run? It's a good question. <laughs> I think it's a. Uh... I think it's going to be great. I think that we all had some time off 
and time away from each other. And I think I can just tell the way we're interacting and the way we look at each other that we're ready to go back <clears throat> on tour and uh, do it again because, like Neela said, I think we're a lot more prepared than we realized. The first run was just there was no book you could read or Google search that would have gotten you out of some of the situations you find yourself in when it's your, when it literally is your first rodeo. So I think this time around it will be a lot more fun, and I think we'll be able to get something and also give something back to, to each other and ourselves. All right. Well, I'll get you guys back over there to play Sounds one more good. song. Cool. Thank you. Thank cool. you so much. Thank you.